Small Invasive Plants in Ontario, Canada. I'm going to define invasive plant for you. I'm going to review a few important concepts, uh, important to uh, understand and keep in mind as we then review a list of ornamental invasive plants that should not, for the most part, in fact in all parts that I can conceive of, be in your garden in Ontario Ontario, in Canada, in fact in most of North America. These are garden plants, many of which you will know well, and all of which you should find an alternative to if you can at all. And I'll mention a few alternatives. Remember, this is an introduction. It is not a survey course. Uh, it's to get you up to speed uh, and, and, find, and let you know that you're not dependent on these invasive plants. There are other ways of handling it. So let's, let's move right on. What is an invasive species? Well, it's a plant, animal, or uh, microorganism. And we're going to talk about plants today. So I'm going to use the word invasive plant instead of in invasive species. An invasive plant is one that was accidentally or deliberately brought into or introduced into Ontario um, that came from someplace else in the world. Now, we have to be very careful about native. Native is a, a little bit of a problem. It's a little arbitrary. But for the purposes of this discussion and for invasive species as a whole, a native plant is a plant that was here before European uh, colonization uh, started. So if the Europeans and, and later other peoples of the world brought the plant in, and it wasn't part of the ecosystem, the plants of Ontario. And, and here's the important part, and it does harm. In other words, the plant is brought in from someplace else into Ontario, and then it causes harm once it's established by its spread. It reduces biodiversity. It causes economic harm, say, to agriculture. Uh, harm to society, to the aesthetics, to your natural areas, uh, and or harm to your health. So let me try that again. An invasive plant is a non-native plant that is known to or is likely to cause economic, aesthetic, biologic, environmental harm. It's important to keep this in mind because, for instance, you may know poison ivy. Poison ivy is native. It was here before the Europeans got here. Technically, it's not an invasive species. It can be a weed. It can be a problem. It can be a nuisance. And it sure can cause um, a lot of harm if you get tangled up in it. But for the definition that we're going to use, it's not invasive. Very important to keep in mind that just because a plant was brought from someplace else doesn't make it bad. Let me say that again. Just because a plant was brought from someplace else doesn't make it bad. There's a tendency to, uh, to conflate invasive, harm, native, exotic, and then confuse everything for outcomes that we desire. I'm talking about plants that have shown to do harm. Now with that, what do these species have in common? Well, these are invaders. The, the very word invader comes from Latin. It means to uh, go into. And over the centuries in English, it's taken on a pejorative or, or um, negative meaning. So zebra mussels, uh, the giant carrot there, relative of the carrot, uh, giant hogweed. If you don't know this plant and you run into it, you will know it. Gives, um, well, it's, it's bad. It can cause cancer um, and burns to the skin, makes poison ivy look like a um, chump. And then, of course, the beautiful little beetle on the right, which is munching its way through ash trees. So invasives come in uh, many colors, qualities. We're going to focus on the plants. What they have in common is they impact negatively. They alter uh, unpredictably the ecosystems of Ontario. They affect you, maybe not in the short term, but they're going, they affect you in the long term. And some of them, like the one in the, in the center, that can affect you very quickly. 
So a little history, a little concept to, to keep in mind here. Canada has a long, very long, from a, a European point of view, uh, relationship and history to gardening. Gardening, ornamental gardening is not new to Canada. Canada. Canadians have been managing their personal spaces for as long as Canadians from Europe ha have uh, settled down and established. Ornamental gardening is a big industry in Canada. It's an important industry. Ornamental gardens increase the value of personal property. They allow people to enjoy personal property and the surrounding space. Ornamental horticulture has provided medicinal, pharmaceutical, um, as well as aesthetic, uh, aesthetic um, inputs to property owners. Canada has a long tradition of a nursery industry that has worked hard to bring useful plants to Canada. Need to keep that in mind. Useful plants. Canadian horticulture set out to help the establishment of Canada to provide resources not readily available. The next concept that's, that's very important to this entire conversation is perception is reality. Why do people want to manage landscapes? If you look at the picture on the left, it's a summer day. It's a bare, an invitation to go barefoot. The fact that it's a biological desert is secondary to the fact that most people would not find a problem removing their shoes and walking across the managed landscape. The picture on the left says, we're in control here, you're safe. The picture on the right does not invite you to sit down for a picnic. And while the picture on the right perhaps is more resilient and sustainable, and if you are landscape literate, uh, more inviting. You don't play a uh, shuttlecock there. Football doesn't work very well. And sitting down on a blanket without first inspecting what might be in that berm there is not recommended. The perception is reality. When it comes to invasive garden plants, I call this dangerous beauty. Something can be inviting and beauty, beautiful at first glance but have hidden unintended consequences and damages to the environment. This is the conflict between short-term need and long-term outcomes. Now I'm taking a guess as a resident of your uh, neighbor to the south that you have some of these, probably mushrooming up all over the place. The McMansion which uh, sets out to recreate an English baronial estate uh, by eliminating everything natural in sight. You know, a, a suburban development, uh, so the saying goes, is where the developer cuts down all the native trees and then names the streets after them. And he replaces them with a McMansion and a, a biological desert, some turf grass, usually not native, that requires a lot of horticultural input and work to maintain, plus a few things in the background out of scale that are reasonably, in, uh, well, they're indestructible. And this, um, this tradition of gardening in Canada, and, and let me go back, from exquisite artful representation of plants, many of which are not native, oops, sorry about that, to this kind of universal suburban, gee, I'm not really a garden, so I'll call this a gardening. These two, kind of, these two traditions are running in the background when we talk about invasive plants. You are faced with a, an area, a landscape, a property. You want to do something to it. You may find the Canadian gardening traditions and, and really put the energy into it, or you may uh, not, you may do this, but either way you're relying on a palette of species not native, not connected, with no intrinsic relationship to the rest of the environment around you. 
you are creating a biologic island disconnected from the natural areas. Another concept to keep in mind before we get into the list is the problem of, gee, I planted one, how much harm? Look how big Ontario is. What is one plant going to do? The problem tends to turns out that by the time you see you have a problem with a particular plant, it's usually too costly to do anything about it. And when there's only one or two, most people in the gardening community are pretty protective of their one or two and say, I don't see a problem. Why are you on my case? Now, this, this introduction curve and establishment has a lot to do with invasive ornamental plants tend to have a tendency not to stay put, to jump the garden fence, and establish in places you didn't intend. In other words, you, the gardener, who, choose, who, have ch who, who chose an invasive plant, have externalized the damage of that plant onto the common good. When it seeds itself or crawls, however it expands and establishes over the fence, you're only looking inwards and you're not saying, well, it will, well, what you are saying is that's not my problem. The damage the plant does once it leaves my yard, well, that's natural. Of course, the fact that the plant isn't natural here in Ontario uh, sort of escapes the debate. So invasive plants uh, have a lag time. It's very rare that one plant is planted and then it swamps Ontario. In fact, I can't think of any example. I looked. It takes multiple introductions over time for the plant to reach a point where it can hop the fence on a regular basis and establish in Canadian ecosystems, natural landscapes, getting us into the yellow, orange, and red area. In other words, an invasive plant an invasive garden plant is a natural area weed. And talking to those of you who are gardeners, if you are a gardener, you know rule number one. In the morning, with your cup of coffee, you go out, and the very first thing you do is look for plants that don't belong there. Every gardener knows that's the first thing you do. Because if you can get the plant before it's fully established, the weed, then you can spend the rest of the day enjoying the garden, managing the garden, being in the garden. But if you let that weed go day after day and expand until it takes over the garden, well, the fun of gardening quickly disappears. This is a problem of invasive plants as a rule and, in, and ornamental invasives uh, specifically. Ornamental invasives. Well, they hop over the fence. They still look beautiful along the roadside. We don't get out there and control them because, well, they're beautiful or we have no resources to do so. And very soon we find ourselves in Ontario overwhelmed by plants out of place. The wrong plants in the wrong place at the wrong time is the very definition of an ornamental invasive. Let me give you one more uh, concept thing. This is the traditional suburban, uh, at least down here. Um, maybe you'll all write me and say, oh, no, up here in Canada, we, we don't ever do this. This is the typical landscape from the non-gardener who wants plants that are indestructible. And so most of these plants have a technical name that ends in japonica. And the reason is nothing eats it. You can uh, run into it with the lawnmower. You can overwater it and underwater it. And you can say that you're being environmentally sensitive because there's no predator, no prey, no insect that consumes these things from Asia. You don't need insecticides. The fact that you've planted plants that your native insects can't eat, you see as a good thing. Without the native insects, of course, then you don't have native songbirds. I commend to you Doug Tallamy's book, in case you've forgotten this important link. You really do need plants that native insects can eat so you can have native birds, so you can have a, a vibrant, vigorous Ontario Canadian ecosystem that's self-sustaining. When you fill the ecosystem with things that end in Japonicus or come from Asia or Europe or Africa or South America, 
you are dismantling your own self-sustaining, resilient ecosystem. So let's start right in. I like to call this plant shade kudzu, and I was a little worried that you might not know what kudzu is, and then, of course, I remembered you already have kudzu. Uh, so speaking of invasions, you have um, already experienced the real thing kudzu. And this is the shade kudzu, English ivy, hetera helix. Now, English ivy is a great garden plant. I used to run a garden center and nursery, and the customer would come in, usually the non-gardening partner, and say, my wife made me sell the boat. I have a dead spot. Uh, the grass won't grow. It's dry shade. And she insists that I repair the damage. I want to buy a plant that grows anywhere that's guaranteed for three lifetimes and is cheap. Did I mention I don't want to feed it, cut it, weed it, or do anything to it? So, of course, uh, we sold them English ivy. It met the criteria. It was indestructible. You didn't have to weed it, feed it, do anything to it. Uh, and then English ivy did what English ivy is supposed to do. Its beautiful stage is the ground cover. But, of course, it has an adult stage, which is a woody plant that uses whatever is available as its support structure. It doesn't have a solid trunk. It climbs up a tree, turns into the adult form woody plant, blooms, has beautiful little white flowers if you can actually get up there and see them, red berries that the birds spread all over the place, which you don't see on the ground because it doesn't bloom in the juvenile state. And once it's up on your native trees, and even some of the non-native trees, and, and, and is graduated into this adult form, English ivy then becomes a burden that the tree itself can't support. And so then you get winds, ice, rain, snow, the, lateral, the limbs break off, and you're left with the English ivy tree. Of course, you've got a dead real tree, but you have an English ivy tree. English ivy is a no-no. It's shade kudzu. It needs to go. There are lots of alternatives. I quickly mentioned the Christmas fern for an evergreen dry shade native. And uh, if you want something less ferny, Allegheny spurge. Uh, again, this is not an in-depth uh, discussion of alternatives. There are many other alternatives. For instance, the non-native um, barren wart. Uh, comes to mind, Epimedium. Epimedium, like the native Pachysandra, have a drawback from some gardener's point of view. They're dormant in the winter. It's interesting that in the 20th century, we decided that the winter in Canada should be green. Of course, the color of winter in Canada, as the rest of eastern North America, is brown. But English ivy is green all year, and so we sort of insist we want a green carpet out of time. Um, and we put our nose in the air and say we don't want to deal with Pachysandra because it's not green in the winter. But if you get into the cycles, the beautiful cycles of the four seasons of Ontario, then Pachysandra procumbens is a wonderful alternative. Moving right along, Miscanthus, when I was in the nursery business in the 80s, I had every vari new variety of Miscanthus I could get my hands on. What a glorious plant. Uh, in the late 80s, I was told that it was invasive, and I had no idea what anybody was talking about. And I did a little research, and they said, well, it's not sterile. It spreads. So I uh, sowed some seed with my propagator in a greenhouse, and sure enough, we got better than 99% germination rate, and I started looking around our 80-acre nursery, and I'd find miscanthus seedlings and hybrids coming up in very strange places. Being a nursery, we were able to take care of it. Being a nursery, we also said, uh-oh, there's a problem. The real sin here of miscanthus is, uh, as you go down the east coast of the United States, especially starting in my state of Maryland, outside of Washington, D.C., and heading into Virginia, North Carolina, it takes over our interstate road systems and creates a dense mat, a rooted mat that if somebody uh, throws a cigarette out or for, there's a spark, catches on fire and is very hard to put out. And that's the least of the trouble that this plant can cause as it forms um, 
an impenetrable monoculture. I, I've used that word several times. It eliminates all other species. And, and that includes insects, amphibians, and of course the songbirds and the butterflies, let alone all of the native plants. There are natives. Here's one, Panicum virginia. This is switchgrass. Um, this is native to uh, North America. And while it doesn't exactly have the grand, um, perhaps, fountain look of a full-grown miscanthus, for most situations, you can use this. It belongs here. It's a native. There are many alternatives to miscanthus. Well, multiflora rose getting ready to come into bloom down here uh, south of you. So I'm assuming it'll bloom a little later up there. Um, beautiful plant for about four days while it blooms. That's the picture on the right. The picture on the left requires a very large DH caterpillar tractor along with probably sticks of dynamite, leather chaps, suit of armor. You never want to get caught in this thing. And who would want this in the garden? The interesting thing is it rarely looks like this in the garden. It hops the garden fence and destroys the natural areas around it. It's just incredible difficult to control once it gets to the state on the left. And how unnecessary. This plant was used for hedgerows and agriculture. The nursery industry in the early 20th century used it for root stock for hybrid teas. Um, it's not used for those purposes for the most part today. Uh, and you in the garden, to get the look, my goodness, you have the Canadian Explorer series. Now, these are not native, they're hybrids, but they're not known invasives. They don't go anywhere. What, what a great plant over on the right. You want rose flowers, and you don't want that evil-looking mess that I just showed you. And if you want to go native, there are so many natives. I picked one at random, Rosa Carolina, which is hardy to zone four. I know parts of Ontario are less, but there are rose solutions for you. Uh, you just need to do a little work. You don't have to plant multiflora rose to have a rose garden in Ontario. Well, the honeysuckles, I, I put up Lanicera japonica, the famous Japanese honeysuckle. Uh, when I was growing up, it grew on the barbed wire fence. Um, used to go out in the summer and sneak away from my German grandfather. I wanted to get away from pulling weeds, and the sweet sugar water was a break. I thought this was a great plant until I now have it on my seven acres. Every place I look, I can't pull the stuff fast enough. It's a disaster. And it's not just Japanese honeysuckle. There are bush honeysuckles. They come in two colors, very fragrant and more fragrant, yellow and white, and sort of white. Now, here's the really appalling thing. We have native honeysuckles, and they come in a rainbow of colors. Yes, they're not quite as fragrant. In fact, they're not very fragrant. The American analogs to Asian invasives tend to be less fragrant. But why would you want the boring old yellow Japanese honeysuckle when you could have this? And it's native. You said you need the honeysuckle for the hummingbirds? Plant the native one. How exquisite. A whole range of colors. No blues, folks, no blues. Well, moving right along, um, here's an example from uh, shade tree land. The Norway maple, fast-growing shade tree. And let me point out that the Norway maple is a gorgeous tree. It's just gorgeous. It grows reasonably fast. So in McMansion land, this is a street tree of choice. Um, and a lot of invasive trees happen to have that same exquisite quality. They grow fairly fast. They keep a nice, uh, predictable shape. Um, and then they take over square miles where nothing can germinate underneath. Nothing can live underneath except for the occasional lost native white-tailed deer on the way to you, uh, devour your garden. It's a desert. You get a Norway maple desert. Remember that graph I showed you? The Norway maples take decades to establish, 10, 20 years to get established, and maybe another 10 years to really start wreaking havoc along roadways and making incursions into your natural areas. Why do you need a Norway maple in Ontario, Canada? 
You've got perfectly good maples for Canada and North America. The sugar maple and the red maple. And there are more maples. Remember, the native maples are host to more insect species and, then, and therefore better to wildlife as a whole than the Norway maple. Well, some time in the 1980s, down here in the, in, in the, the United States, we got into this uh, craze of being the, having to have the latest fast-growing ornamental vine. Ornamental bittersweet, uh, porcelain berry, the list goes on and on. Uh, these are for people who want to cover garden fences or sound barriers or really intimidate their neighbor, uh, whatever the reason. Oriental bittersweet uh, is a takeover plant. Invasive species come in trees, they come in shrubs, they come in grasses, they come in flowers, but where they really excel are in vines. Before you plant a vine, know what you're doing. The very nature of a viney plant is to crawl, cover, and to crawl up on, to crawl up over, and to cover large pieces of land, preventing anything else come, to come out. Native vines are nature's band-aids. Non-native vines are, are nature's pillow covers smothering uh, everything in sight. Well, and of course, we have uh, native vines. There are plenty of native vines. And one that comes to mind down here, and I think, I suspect uh, grows at least in southern Ontario, would be a trumpet vine. Uh, if you need an aggressive vine to pull down your house, you can. there are native vines that will do that, and they're not invasive. They belong here. Whether it's native or exotic, invasive or not, before you plant a vine, know what you're doing. I can't stress that anymore. This is beyond uh, invasive. Uh, you can cause a lot of damage to your house by planting trumpet vine and not knowing what you're going to get. Well, barberry. Now, barberry is one of the first plants to show up as an invasive plant um, on modern European radar. Uh, farmers burned down the local town hall in the south of France uh, around 16, oh, 1660, 1665, because uh, they suspected that barberry equaled uh, no wheat. They didn't understand what was going on, but they knew when people planted medicinal barberry, not this one, but uh, Berberis vulgaris, uh, that suddenly wheat was, they couldn't harvest the wheat. Um, as early as 1726 in Connecticut, uh, the state of, the colony of Connecticut was trying to ban barberry. You'd think that would be a clue. I haven't seen when the first Canadian don't plant barberry law went in, but I suspect that it's a pretty old law. Barberry, Berberis vulgaris, common barberry, and then the Japanese barberry that came in uh, after the mid-19th century is a great landscape tool, dependable plant that designers turn to when they're not thinking about the impact on natural areas, resilient ecosystems, and sustainable environment. The barberry is a great plant, for instance, to plant in a corner of a building where you want to keep, um, say, unsavory people from standing in shadows. Nobody goes and stands in barberry. I describe barberry plants as uh, living barbed wire. So if you need security, you plant barberry. But you're planting it and not thinking about what happens to the little barberries that expand. Imagine a woodlands covered in, bar in barbed wire. That's what you get when the barberry takes off from its designated place. Barberry doesn't stay put. Barberry is a big, big problem, especially in Ontario and the northeast of the United States. The problem is there are many cultivars. Barberry comes in red, greens, and yellows. It's simply a gorgeous, fundamental, ornamental plant. 
uh, of everything I've shown you, this really is a dangerous beauty because not only is this aesthetically pleasing, um, it has a lot of uses in the landscape that are difficult to replace without doing a little research. You could probably do a whole show on just barberry and alternatives because of the many uses. Barberry can be planted to direct traffic in parking lots. When you don't want people taking a shortcut through the storm water management pond, you surround it with barberry. Looks beautiful, can't see the trash behind it, and nobody's going to cross through a row of barberry. It's in some places protected almost evergreen. It has flowers, it has berries. I mean, it's got everything you want, but the damage to a natural area is incredible. You can't get in because everything below uh, you know, and walking distance is thorns. Think of rolls of barbed wire strung out of the front lines of trenches, and that's what barberry is when it gets loose. I can't repeat enough or highlight enough the problem that you face here is what's good for you personally right now may not necessarily, and in this case, surely isn't, a benefit to the common good and you tomorrow. You plant the barberry because it looks good in the front of the house and later on you want to take a hike through the woods and it's covered in barberry. This is why. There are alternatives. Um, like English ivy alternatives, um, not all of them have 100% mapping of the features onto the plant that you don't want. In other words, chokeberry doesn't have thorns. But if you need the red color in the fall, this is a beautiful native plant. Many, many, there are many alternatives. Again, this is an introductory talk. Uh, not a landscape design, what I'm hoping that you're starting to take away is that you're not limited in your choices. The horticulture started out in the 18th century um, as uh, looking for solutions to provide feed, food, fiber, flowers, forests, and pharmaceuticals to name a few. Eventually, horticulture was relegated in the 19th century. It was supplanted by commercial agriculture, the business of monocropping. Horticulture has always uh, been looking for solutions to problems. And the introduction of plants into Canada was, um, at one time, a significant thing that you could do. If you were a Canadian and you could find a plant that could help the commerce and the people of Canada and you could bring it in, you were expected to do that. That was a highlight of a career in the 18th and 19th century, finding useful plants. That's what horticulture. By the end of World War I, horticulture in North America had become a, an expression of personal artistic choice. It, it had left uh, the, the world of fruit trees and, and commercial processes and industry and had become more the science and art of personal expression. And that got us into, I want to be the first person on my road to grow the latest iteration of the newest barberry, for example. This drive to have something new and unique, and by definition, if it's native, how, how new or unique is it, uh, open the floodgates, the pathways of commercial horticulture to bring in so many plants. And what was the test? The test was would it grow in Ontario, not would it establish um, outside of the garden. That wasn't the test. The test was would it grow here? Well, if it grew here and it seeded, there was a likelihood that it could jump the garden fence. And we weren't looking for that. Now, we've been talking about terrestrial plants, but there are plants that grow in water, and there are just uh, any number of invasive, damaging aquatic plants. I picked hydrilla here. Um, it's not the only one. Uh, I don't know if I've got an alternative to this. Aquatic plants 
pose both an easy uh, to get in. Well, there are two problems with aquatics. One, they really don't stay play in place. The whole nature of a water plant is to float downstream. So if you plant hydrilla upstream and it rains, floods, or does anything else, or your pond breaks, it's going immediately to your neighbor and everybody can see that. And secondly, aquatic plants have a, um, like this one, can really destroy very quickly in one season alternative uses of the water. Nothing like trying to water ski in a patch of hydrilla isn't happening. Running your motorboat isn't happening. And so in some sense, it's much easier to see the immediate damage um, of an aquatic ornamental escaping. While we're talking about um, aquatics, and I think this is my last species, Phragmites lives, uh, the common reed grass, lives in between the water, the floating plants like hydrilla, and terrestrials like miscanthus. It's sort of on the shoreline. Interestingly enough, there's a native Phragmites. My understanding is there are two patches, one in Connecticut and one on the eastern shore of Maryland. I haven't heard or seen of one in Ontario. I'll let your um, experts and professionals correct me on that. So if you see Phragmites, you are pretty safe in assuming that it's not native. I hope that we can double check that. Phragmites is an example of a plant that sometimes was plant, planted for erosion control or just for the aesthetic look of uh, grass in a wetland that took off uh, and expanded up and down stream beds, creek beds, and riverways. And it does this monoculture thing. It changes the salinity. It changes the pH. It changes the entire dynamics of the water ecosystem meaning that your native frogs, native toads, native insects, native birds, nothing can live there. It makes a sterile environment. Well, invasive plants and ornamental gardening. This is a topic that I've spent 25 years talking about. There are so many native plants that can work in a garden. And let me be very clear, not be, I don't happen to be you must plant a native. I think that there are exotics for certain places at certain times that are useful. But every time I plant an exotic, I remember that I'm disrupting the food chain of the ecosystem that supports me. And I weigh the damage to the ecosystem that if Everybody, if ev all of my neighbors do exactly what I'm doing, what is the outcome? And then the other th piece of this is, what is my responsibility as a gardener to the landscape as a whole? Early ornamental horticulture societies, horticulture societies, both in the United States and Canada, were not founded on teaching people how to um, individually express themselves, but rather what was, what should the community look like? What plants did serve the community best? Early 19th century horticulture was not about what you personally could do, but how you integrated your property into a community design and landscape. Somehow, I think we need to get back to this. Ontario has many, to, uh, has many plants. You are not limited because I've mentioned 12 invasive plants that should not be planted. You have native plants. You have a nursery industry that is ready and willing to step in and, and, and provide you with plants that don't do damage. What I hope I've, what I hope I've done today is, is gotten you to ask questions. A little bit of curiosity goes a long way. Before you plant it, know what it potentially can do and ask yourself how important is your feel-good moment versus the common good and the environment and, and ecosystem that supports you. So with that, uh, looks like I had enough time to do more species and whizzed right through this. Um, I want to thank you. 
and uh, look forward to talking to you again. Okay, thanks, John Peter. A reminder to everyone that there's another webinar June 3rd. If you look at InvasivePlantControl.com, you can see the um, title and the information for that. And that this presentation has been recorded and will be online hopefully by um, maybe in a day or two. We'll have it set up and put up online. If you go to InvasivePlantControl.com and just go to the IPC Web Solutions section, you'll find it there. Thanks for everyone attending and have a good day. Bye.